On today's episode, we have finesse fishing legend, Mr. Ned Cady. We talk with Ned about the history of finesse fishing in the Midwest, some techniques that were really important to the style of fishing over the years, and of course, we talk about the Ned Rig. All that and more on this episode of Tackle Talk. Hello everybody, I'm Bill Dance, and you're listening to Tackle Talk. The Tackle Talk Podcast, brought to you by American Legacy Fishing and Outdoors, world-class fishing gear, unmatched personal service. Now, here's your host, Andrew Hayes. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Tackle Talk Podcast. As always, we are brought to you by American Legacy Fishing and Outdoors. Now, American Legacy Fishing and Outdoors should be your first stop if you're looking for rods, reels, line, lures, and you're looking for them with a great selection, fast shipping, and incredible customer service. That's what American Legacy Fishing hangs their hat on. They will make things right for you. They will price match. They will help you get something in stock if you're looking for something in particular. If you have some questions about maybe what rod would be best suited for what, maybe listen to this episode and you want to start throwing Ned Rigs a lot, you know, go talk to them. They can help you out. Go join their Facebook page. It's American Legacy Fishing and Outdoors Community page. They do some really cool stuff over there. So like today, they had the Mega Bass Respect Color Sunset Teaser released today. And that is kind of the, if you're not into the Mega Bass stuff, Mega Bass Respect Colors are all the rage and everybody has to get them really quickly and they sell out in minutes and all this kind of stuff. Well, American Legacy Fishing got the Sunset Teasers in for the Vision 110s, the 110 Juniors, the Pop Maxes. They sold them online and then they also held back a certain number of these so they could do a raffle on the Facebook page and give people a chance to buy them that way. So kind of like a lottery style. So some really cool stuff that you get over at the Facebook page. Great info, great advice. Um, and they do some really cool promotions too. So they're just finishing up a promotion where if you spend $214 or more, they're going to send you a box of chocolates with your order so you can stay out of the doghouse on Valentine's Day for ordering more fishing gear. That's the kind of stuff you get with American Legacy Fishing. So go check them out, www.americanlegacyfishing.com and use code Tackle Talk. Talk 10, Tackle Talk 10 at checkout, and you're going to save 10% off your entire order. You need some Dobbins rods, you need Daiwa reels, you need whatever. Go use Tackle Talk 10 at checkout. Some exclusions apply, but most things on that website, 10% off your entire order, AmericanLegacyFishing.com. All right, let's get to today's episode. Today, I am very excited because, ladies and gentlemen, we have an episode that I have wanted to do for a long, long time. For the past probably 10 years or so, I've been throwing a Ned Rig. I throw it in creeks, I throw it in rivers, I throw it in ponds and lakes. Before I even knew what a Ned Rig was, I was pretty much throwing a Ned Rig. We were throwing small plastic worms on jig heads. And since probably half of my darn fish over the past decade have come on a Ned Rig, I've always obviously wanted to talk to Ned. Well, today, we get a chance to talk to Ned. So what you're going to hear in this episode is really just a wealth of knowledge that really only Ned can provide. So Ned was there, Ned kept records, Ned's been a really rock-solid historian for the style of fishing that's influenced me personally, and then a lot of people around the country too. So this idea of Midwest finesse fishing is really only probably a generation or two old, and Ned has done so much to preserve that history, to kind of pay respects to the early purveyors of finesse fishing and to really pass along the stories and the lineage to a new generation of anglers. So yes, most people are going to associate Ned Cady with the Ned Rig because it bears his name, but in this episode, we're going to dive into so much more than that. We're going to learn about the true history, how it came to fruition, how Ned kind of became intertwined with this folklore and history that is the Ned Rig, and how he specifically fishes the rig. So jig weight, line weight, rod length, reels, retrieves, we go through all of it. So this episode was an absolute pleasure to be a part of. I'm very excited to share it with you all. So let's get to our conversation with Ned Cady. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are joined today by Mr. Ned Cady. We're very, very excited to have him. We are going to talk about something that, as you guys know, is very near and dear to my heart, and that is finesse fishing, specifically Midwest finesse fishing, not just the history of it, but, you know, how it gets kind of 
I think changed a long time from how it originated to how it kind of evolved to how people are using it today. This will be a really interesting conversation. So Ned, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you're quite welcome. It's a joy being here. Perfect. So the first place I want to start is your writing, because you are first and foremost a very prolific writer. I think if anybody's ever read your articles, you get sucked into the amount of detail you put into these articles, the history, the fact that you're able to recall so much accurate information, especially from those early days of Midwest finesse tactics. I mean, if you listen to or, or or read any of your articles, you're going to hear the names of Chuck Woods, you're going to hear Ray's name, Drew Reese, um, Dwight Kiefer, uh, Hibden, you know, all of those guys from back in the day. And I love how much you pay homage to those guys, too, for being able to kind of start what has now become a full-blown fanaticism about Midwest fishing. So where did your love of writing come from? Because it's really obvious that you have an extreme passion for that end of it, too. Well, it, I... I uh... I really didn't start writing until uh, 1980. Uh, you know, I'm 80, 80, almost 82 years old now. So for, for my first 40 years, I, I really didn't write. I, I, uh, I was a, uh, an archivist at the University of Kansas for, for a number of years. And dealt, I dealt with a lot of writing. You know, other people wrote it. I, I archived it, essentially. But uh, I started writing uh, for In Fisherman in 1981. I did a I did a story uh, about uh, Jason Lucas, Fred Fred Potoff, and uh, Keto Hibbins' father, and how they made a big influence on fishing at that time. And uh, so that's when I started, and uh, everything has developed ever since then. I retired from writing essentially uh, November eleventh, nineteen uh, nineteen eighty. I mean twenty 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 twenty. I'm sorry. So I've, I've been so I've uh, when I was eighty when I was eighty year olds I kind of retired because in fishermen kind of changed a lot of new guys came in and I just thought it was time for me to let them do you know because I'm, I'm of the old lender school where we wrote a lot a lot a lot of words you know and, and nowadays it's you know it's not not thought of to be the thing to do so it's harder really to write fewer words than it is a lot of words you know because you got to be a good editor and I'm not a very good editor so but that's when I started and I and I you know for a while from but 19 no actually from 2011 to uh, November of uh, 2020 I was writing about 10 to 30,000 words a month about Midwest finesse so I you know I would not every word was about Midwest finesse but most of the words were so and you know, back when I was when I was a youngster, uh, Guido Hebden, uh, I, Guido and I grew up in the same area, and we he and I guided together as kids. You know, and back to, oh, in the nineteen seventies, he encouraged me to start doing logs. And actually, Rick Clun actually just was doing logs too, and he encouraged me uh, to do logs. And so I started doing them, and I still been doing them. I, every every trip we do, I, I log them very thoroughly. And uh, almost, I'm almost fanatical about him, essentially. How did you get connected with In Fisherman back in the day? I just sent him a story in 1981, and uh, they got they they took it, and that's that's how I got started. So it was I used to guide I used to guide in Minnesota back in the 1950s. I was in high school, and I was in Nisswa, Minnesota, which is just right by Brainerd, and. I, this magazine was being produced since the early 1970s, and so I, you know, was interested in it. And I just sent them a story, and they, they, they bought it, and then so I just, I've been writing from there ever since. I've written for a few other for other magazines a little bit, and some news. I used to have a newspaper column in the Topeka paper, and I live in Lawrence, Kansas, and I had a column here too. You said someone encouraged you to start the fishing logs. The fishing logs are really interesting, too, because if, if you're listening to this and you've never got a chance to read some of Ned's fishing logs, the amount of just sheer information that you can pack into one of those logs, it is uh, it's m like down to the minute of the time that you start and stop. It's visibility, times, pressure, you know, barometric, it's, it's wind, temperature, everything, number of fish caught. And you actually log, if I'm not mistaken, I think every single fish that you catch throughout the year, right? Oh yes, 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 we do. Yeah. So, and, uh, how is it? How is it that you found the, I, I guess, the persistence to keep that up? Because it is a lot of work that it adds to, you know, a day of fishing is to be able to remember to log and to come home and write all that. Well, it's fun. 
I, I think it's fun. You know, it's my sense of joy. It's kind of a weird sense of joy. If you, if you can find joy in something, that's how you do it. And I just have a maybe a strange sense of joy. And uh, I like keeping you know, those are statistics. And, you know, Guido, Guido was one whale of a fisherman. And he encouraged me to do that type of thing. Not that hard. But every once in a while, he said, you're still doing your logs? And I wasn't always doing them. And uh, I threw away a bunch of my logs back in the, from the 1970s, 80s. I regret it to this day now when I threw them away. But it's like, you know, I, I just, you, I, you, you, this, this is a, this is a log. This is how I, I, when I come home, I write them down. And then I, I, then I do, and then I record them on the, on the computer. But these go back here to, uh, this is 2005, this log book here, you know. And so it's, a, so it's, a, I just, I just, I just take notes while I'm fishing too, occasionally, you know. But I can remember most of the stuff. I'm only fishing now, you know, we used to fish what we used to call bankers hours, 10 to 2, 10, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And that's when most most guys are getting in the water daybreak and getting off the water about 11, you know. So when I'm on the water, nobody else is on the water. And, you know, it's, it's the idea that everybody thinks early morning fishing is better. And, and midday fishing is just as good for me as early morning. I can have breakfast with my wife and our kids and stuff like that, too. So it's, it was a very, very, very good deal. And since COVID has come along, Patty, my wife and I, we fish together. I haven't fished with all my fishing friends hardly at all during the COVID, COVID period here. So Patty and I go fishing. Uh, we, we fish two to three hours, three and a half hours. Rarely do we do four hours. And then when you get to be 81, you know, it gets a little bit harder to harder to fish you know especially this time of year we haven't been on the water since december 31st by the way because we did we, we were on we got ice on the water right now so that's really it, i just the longest i've been off the water for a long long time we usually fish you know two to three days a week you know so so now you're doing what you kind of refer to yourself as geriatric fishing, which that was a yes. term that until I read your initial email, I've never heard the term geriatric fishing before. And it makes perfect sense. I read your article about it, but I'd like to hear from you. And I guess for the folks listening at home too, what in the world is geriatric fishing in your eyes? And why is it such an important part of your life now? Well, I got an old man and my wife, she's an old lady, you know, and uh, I think we as as fishermen you know have been really working on getting youngsters to fish and i decided as an old man we need to prolong our, our abilities to fish and i know you know a lot of guys a lot of my friends are just not fishing like they used to because they have back aches they have shoulder aches they you know they have all kinds of other medical things and i got cancer in uh, 2005 and it was, it was ductal carcinoma in my urinary uh, canal, and it just could have been very, very serious. And Patty got on this uh, kind of health food kick, you know, and I, and I started going to uh, doing all sorts of exercise routines with a kind of a Pete Agoscu thing. What Pete Agoscu is for for to keep you pain free. And it's worked marvelous for us. Patty and I both do it. Patty's still playing tennis at the age of 81, you know, three times a week. When she gets home from uh, playing tennis, we go fishing, you know, and things like that. So she fish, she plays tennis three to two times a week, and we fish two to three times a week. So it's uh, it works. And, it, and I just sort of, you know, in, in like I, when, when that article I sent you that we worked on, uh, you know, there's, they sell more adult, adult bi diapers in Japan than they do baby diapers you know and there's getting the percentage of people over 65 all over the world is increasing more dramatically than it is people under five years old so i thought instead of just working solely on trying to go under interest in in you know teenagers and young kids into fishing we had thought to try to perpetuate our abilities to fish when we're in our 70s and 80s you know so that's what i'm doing now that's my new that's my new thing rather than Midwest finesse fishing. And it's easy to be a, an old man and fish Midwest finesse, finesse too. So you, you're not, you're not, throw, you know, you're not throwing Alabama rigs and stuff like that. You know, it's a lot easier motif. Reading some of your articles too, and just diving down that history of Midwest finesse, a lot of it, obviously because it's where you're at, but two, just so much of the history of Midwest finesse is Kansas centric. It's a very, you know, that, that Kansas city all around the state, 
Why do you think it was Kansas or your area that really became like the epicenter of this kind of now thing that is countrywide phenomenon? Is it because, you know, you guys may be like me, right? I'm in central Ohio where fishing's tough. You know, I don't have Lake Ray Roberts or, uh, you know, or Lake Fork in my backyard. It's tough fishing and, and finesse styles kind of end up being what you have to go to just to, to go out and, and have a good day versus, right, you're not going to go around here and throw an Alabama rig and have a good day. You're going to go have a good day with a, you know, a weightless Senko or a, a Ned rig or something. So why was it Kansas that really set up to be kind of this epicenter of Midwest finesse? Well, it, it was actually Kansas and Missouri both because Kansas City really is right on the, on the line. It, it runs and this epicenter runs from Kansas City down to, to Bull Shoals Lake and then down, down a little bit south, that's, that's going southeast, and it goes down southwest to Grand Lake in Oklahoma. So it covers, it covers, you know, western Missouri, eastern Kansas, and northern, a little bit of northern Arkansas, and a little bit of northern Oklahoma. And, you know, the fishing really is not not too bad around here. You know, I, there are days, we average 10 bass an hour here in Kansas, you know. I, I fish nothing but public waterways. I, you know, they're, they're community and state lakes and federal lakes, U.S. Army Corps of Engineer lakes. I don't fish the U.S. Corps air, uh, lakes as much as I used to. Uh, we, the, the closest one's only six miles from my front door, but I just don't fish it anymore because it's, it's rougher water and Patty and I, old codgers, we don't really dig fishing, you know, rough water like we used to fish, you know, but so we're fishing smaller lakes that run from 50 acres to 450 acres, essentially. And they're heavily fished. They are heavily, heavily fished. And uh, so, you know, and uh, this is great places for geriatric fishermen to fish where, where I'm fishing. And I, because uh, it's, they're easy to launch your boat and they're easy to, they're just easy. To, they're close. I don't, you know, the closest one is, uh, closest little lake is uh, 16 miles from my house the furthest one is 33 miles from my house and you know and it's just just easy and that's what i want simplicity easiness and frugality were used to be at the heart of my my way to fish you know and it's kind of changing just a little bit uh and i I'll, we'll talk we'll talk about it a little bit better when we get to talking about rods and reels a little bit it's just dramatically changed my life since november 4th in a way so before we get into the Ned rig itself, I want to kind of talk about a couple rigs that had uh, or helped spawn, I guess, the idea of Midwest finesse. So I know there are some rigs out there that either were uh, a big part of it in the beginning or were adopted and altered by, you know, kind of Midwest finesse fishermen. Um, so I know in the email that we exchanged before we kind of started here, you had shed some insight on two rigs in particular that I wanted to hit. The first is the Carolina rig. So can you tell us how, I guess, the modern day Carolina rig got its start and how that is kind of intertwined into the history of, you know, Midwest finesse? Sure. It's uh, It actually dates, dates back to Gato Hibben's father and, uh, and Gato and his brothers fishing in Lake the Ozarks. And back in those days, uh, we we were crawfish fishermen, you know, live crawfish. And we used a split shot rig, essentially. It was, a, you know, a, a number two bait hook and a split shot six to 12 inches above the, above the hook. And uh, we uh, put a live crawdad on it and uh, we went we went bass fishing. And back in those days, we didn't have trolling motors. We used to row the boat a lot. And most of the time, we would just park the boat on the shoreline and, just, and we'd get out and walk the shorelines like on the Lake of the Ozarks. We'd just walk the shorelines rather than row down. Sometimes we'd anchor, but a lot of times we'd row too, you know? So that, and, that, and the split shot rig is actually came before the the, the the Carolina rig, you know, and then back out in out west, they started the Mojo rig, which was a slip sinker replacing the split shot rig. And and uh Cato Hedlund's son Dion started went from the went from that to the use the Mojo rig. And so it really was, you know, the Mojo rig is just a small, lightweight Carolina rig. In the history we have found one of the things Gato was big on is that fishermen use too heavy of jigs, and he taught that to me a long time ago. And I'm not, and now, you know, Gato died several years ago, and uh, but but now I'm I'm we my, I I'm using the pronoun I, but I I use a lot lighter jigs than Gato used to use. You know, eighth ounce was light for him. Occasionally a sixteenth ounce, but I use a lot of one thirty seconds, one twentieth, and one sixteenth. 
I go up to 3.30 seconds when we throw in a grub or something like that, but very, very rarely I I, I don't do it. You know, I, I prefer a 16th. So the, uh, the split shot rig is a Carolina rig, essentially, and we started it as we started it as a crawdad rig with and then we then when the plastic worms started coming around and, the, and when cream came out, you know, in the, in the 40s, it, it, came, got, it got to Missouri and Kansas in the 1950s. And we, we started putting the, the, just replacing the crawdad on and putting that on, on the, on the Carolina rig essentially. And we were, we were just, we were not hooking a Texas rig that time. It was just, it was just on, on the, on the hook. And on part of on part of on part of the line too, we'd rig it up maybe uh, three inches above the line, and the hook would be down by the egg sac essentially, and it would be a, ex, an exposed hook. And you know, I'm a, I'm a big exposed hook fan, you know, and that's that's really uh, the essence of what how I fish. I never I don't never haven't had a Texas rig on for I can't remember the last time I used a Texas rig. It must be thirty years now. So the other one that is in this kind of category, too, is the tube. And I think the tube has a little different story because I believe that started somewhere else and then was kind of uh, adopted or kind of adapted in the Midwest. But can you tell us a little bit about that story in history? Too? Yeah, definitely. You know, Guido Hibden, again, was involved in this, too. You know, he lives he lives in central Missouri and Versailles, Missouri and Gravois Bills, Missouri. And Guido, back in 1980, 81 and 82, was fishing the U.S. Open out in out in Lake Mead. And uh, which was a big, big time, big time deal that, that back in those days. And uh, Guido got hooked up with Bobby Garland as, as back then, as a draw partner. And Bobby was was the the king of the, of the tube. He was he he, came, he created the tube, and, and Guido was Wowie Zowie by and and they were on on, on made and on that day they were they were catching fish in the shadow of the boat they the the bass would come and just get in the shadow of the boat and it was just gator was just absolutely amazed and bobby was he was a really a light jig man uh, actually he won a tournament in new mexico in july fishing in very shallow water with a 132nd ounce of jig head inside his tube you know that's yeah so that's uh and so they uh, Keto, you know, came away with what he, he came back, came back to Missouri and started making tubes. His tube, Bobby Garland's was called the Gizzet, and, and Gato called his the G2, G hyphen two. And he had a G3, and the G2 was a two inch, two inch one. And he, uh, Gato used a 16th ounce jig head, and he had all kinds of different variations. He actually, he would make a jig head that would be the jig, the jig, the lead on one side of the jig would be less than on the left side, and then on the other side, other jig would be less on the left side than it was on the right side. So when he was fishing docks, like the Lake of the Ozarks is called the, the Lake of a Million Docks, and he would on 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 the right side of the of the, uh, of the jig of the of the dock, he would have the the weight that is heavy on the right side, and would cast it up, and it would go kind of slide underneath. Underneath the the the, the, the uh, these are floating docks, they were big on 50, 50 gallon barrels at that time. But now they got styrofoam. They would they would go they would go sliding underneath there, and he would just swim it, kind of shake it, swim it and shake it. And then when he get on the left side, he would have the jig head that has the weight on the right side of the head, and it would go underneath underneath the dock. You know, it was just it was I mean, it was a marvelous marvelous guy with light line and light in 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 light 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 stuff at that time so he came back and redid it he introduced essentially the gizzet to people from from you know from the, the rocky mountains on to on to florida essentially so now we're going to do it we're going to dive into the ned rig itself and i want to start this with one of my favorite articles that i've ever written by you is the, the one that was just titled it it was correct me if i'm wrong it was something like 
a history of uh, Midwest finesse and uh, the so-called Ned Rig or something yeah, like that. Okay. Where it, was, it was just it's funny to see the name Ned Katie writing about the so-called Ned Rig because and that article was so good because basically what if I remember right, it basically paid homage to all of those guys that were early on. It was, again, you know, Guido. It was um, Dwight, um, Virgil. Keith. Uh, yeah, all of those guys. And then yep. it basically said that, uh, you know, they had a huge role in popularizing what is now called the Ned Rig. But for a long time, that wasn't really a huge part of the kind of whole Midwest finesse repertoire. It was just kind of like a small portion of it. And now it's just taken on this huge life of its own. Um, and now your name is obviously attached to it. But one thing that's always interested me is is that you always kind of credit those pioneers. I mean, the packages say Ned on them. They say Ned Rig, but every article that I read by you is paying homage to those early guys and those folks that were starting it out. Can you explain to us how that connection was made, how you became attached to the Ned Rig? Okay. Let, let, let's just give these guys a little bit of credit first. You know, Chuck Woods. Yeah. He, I called him the father of Midwest Finesse. He was a house painter and he was a, a tremendous fisherman. He cut, probably caught more fish in the state of Kansas than anybody in the history of the world. Chuck died in 1975, and Chuck, uh, Chuck, uh, back in 19, in back back in in 1956, the first jig worm was being created, and by a, 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 by Ted Green and Marlin Lure Company in Blue Springs, Missouri, which is adjacent to Kansas City. They came out with a thing called the Squirm. And jig. It was a just a plastic worm on a jig head. It was 1956, and um, uh, you know everybody started using a jig worm then around here because it uh, it, it was you know 16th ounce, eighth ounce head, and and uh, and Chuck 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 would made his own jig his own jigs, and he was using either a, a cream worm or a sportsman's worm or a flip tail worm, and. As you know, he would he would have these he would be fishing along, and these worms you know, they wouldn't last too long. You catch three or four bass on him, and they would be deteriorating. So he'd just put them in his pocket, and he went to, and when he'd come back, he'd have a pocket full of worms, you know. And he would he would go into Fink's tackle shop on Southwest Boulevard in Kansas City, and they'd sit around and talk. Fact, you know, Fink's tackle shop was the first bass club. They'd never have bass clubs, but we had people that would just hang around in there, and they. And Ray Fink would tie rods, and and Chuck Woods would be back in the back, just kind of messing around with baits and trying to make baits. And so he would have the uh, torso of these old torn up worms, and he made the first senko essentially. And, and uh, you know what a, you know what a beetle looks like? Oh yeah. Okay, and and that's the senko essentially, isn't it? But it has a split tail on it, really. You know. Yep. This was back in about 1958. This first senko came out. You know, and. Put it on a jig head, and it just, uh, it was like a Senko is now, or, or, a, or, or what you guys call as a Ned Rig, you know. But this is, this was the first Ned Rig, essentially, was the old, was the old Beetle. And uh, Chuck, and Chuck was always, always very, very, very crazy about jig spinners, you know. And he, he would put a spinner, a jig spinner on that, and was, that became the Beetle spin. And eventually, uh, Bass Buster Lures. Actually, I got a Bass Buster Lure thing here. Okay, Bass Bass Buster Lures. Uh, back back and decided eventually. He, uh, he, Virgil Ward and Bill Ward used to hang out at Fink's Tackle Shop too, and they 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 decided to make the Beetle in the Beetle Spin, and uh, it was it was dynamite. It was for a while it was probably the greatest selling bait in the history of the world. You know, but Chuck didn't make a dime off of it, essentially. He didn't make a dime off of it. And but it was such a good bait, just fish fishing it as a on a jig head. Virgil Ward used to go down to Grand Lake and fish a couple of riprap uh, uh, uh shorelines down there on, on some causeways. And just actually he walloped and walloped and walloped them. Yeah, it was just and fishing it on a 16 pound jig again, you know, and and it was just that was the start of it. those guys did it before I did, you know. I'm so yeah, I just I what I've done is I write I write about it, you know, rather than and I use it, yeah, because I love it and catches fish. But that's 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 how it started, you know. And then there's a lot more to it too, you know, then and the 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 uh, the, uh, 
the, the, the Marbu Grub, Marbu, Marbu Jig also plays a big, big role in this too. And that was invented by Bill Ward in 1957. His, his dad was going to go fish with Harold Lindsay. Harold Lindsay had a TV show here in Kansas City. And they were going down to fish on the White River above both shows for trout fishing. And back in those days, a fly fish went down there, but you were using a Marbu streamer. And, and, uh, and, uh, and Virgil said, Bill, I want you to tie me a jig. Yeah, it looks like a, a, a Marabou streamer. And he, and he tied the very first Marabou jig. And, and from that day on, in fact, this is one of, uh, this is one of, one of the original uh, Marabou jigs, right? Can you see it? Oh, yeah. Wow. Yep. yep. This is one of the Marabou. This is a, this is a black one. This is an eighth ounce one. They, they would, then they would go up in the late 50s <clears throat> up to fish uh, Lake of the Woods up in, up in Canada. And using a one thirty second and one sixteenth ounce jig up there, and Bill told me they, they were catching so much, so many smallmouth bass. And this is not a, really an exaggeration, I don't think. They, their their wrist hurt. They had to stop and go fish for, wall, for a walleye, you know. And that's more of the whole. This whole thing, these these this, these these marabou jigs are really, really very, 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 very important to how we developed. The so-called Ned rig, and another aspect I need to add: I never. Bert Hall was lived down in Forsyth, Missouri, and he he, the road runner. After the after the jig after the jig was made, he made the road runner, which had a had a you know spinner a spinner blade attached to the head, which is you know everything that's now a big time deal. You know, a lot of people are using these, these spinner rigs like that, but that was done in nineteen you know nineteen fifty seven. You know, and that's very. Very long time ago, and that played a very important role in Midwest finesse fishing too. You know, well, and that's played a big role up to today with Aaron Martin's. You know, sure, uh, Aaron, right. lately, you know, he popularized a lot of that kind of stuff too. So yeah, that's it. Still has staying power. Sure, right, and so it that's but it it all started you know in this whole triangle from Kansas City down to Bull Shoals down to you know Grand Lake. So it's all within this realm right here, and. Uh, uh, and Chuck Woods also made another great, great contribution, which is is is, is the puddle jumper. I don't know if you guys have ever run into the puddle jumper or not. Or not. Have you ever done that? Seen that? I have never thrown that before. Uh, the puddle jumper still being made. It was made by Barlow and Lure Company, and they Ted Green has died, so has Harold Ensley. It's down now in Arkansas, but he made it. Chuck Woods made it in, in Fink's tackle shop. You know the Reaper. You, you know what the yeah. Reaper is? Yes. Okay. This is Air Lindsay's Reaper, which he he created in 1961, 62, came out in 63. The tail part of this thing is where this is where the uh, can you can I can you see that? Oh yeah. The tail part of it is where the uh, the puddle jumper came out of. He just said use a pair, of, you know, a pair of scissors and little knives and just cut the cut the puddle jumper out just like this. And actually the puddle jumper. It's, it's still in Minnesota, around Minnesota. It's still the best crappie bait in all of Minnesota. It's still oh, being that looks used. killer. Yeah. yeah it, it is, you know, and actually Z-Man is making a new thing now called the Hog Z, which looks a little bit like this thing. So That's what I was about this, to ask you. I was about yeah. to ask you if there was any influence from the Hog Z because well, that looks fairly I, I think, similar. I think I sent Z-Man one of these things, you know, and, and, but I don't, I can't, I can't recall, you know, it's been, but, but, you know, in the, the, uh, the action, the, the 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 reaper was a pretty famous bait for a long time. It's kind of died died out now. You know, Guido Hibden used it a heck of a lot back in the sixties, and that's how we really started really using spinning tackle a lot. Because Harold Inslee took he used this the beat the uh, reaper was made to go to Canada to fish for lake trout. And okay, they, they they the the wards and and Harold Inslee went up there and used to use big marabou jigs, and then Harold Harold and and, and Virgil had a kind of a falling out. And he came in in Virgil and Harold made the 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 reaper for to go to go to Canada to take the big lake, lake trout. So you know that's how we things are still going. We're getting up to the Ned rig things. They have to go a little bit further. And then eventually, uh, in the night in the nineteen actually the the uh, the the, uh, the 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 puddle jumper wasn't really made until the nineteen seventies. And Gato Hebden. It came out with he came the first creature bait, 
which is called the the Gator Bug, you know. And this was the very the very first cre- creature bait. And this was made by his son Dion in a science class when when he was in in 1976. I think he was a, a freshman in high school, and he they took the live crawdads and put them in plaster Paris, uh, you know, and uh, and then poured plastic plastic worm hot plastic worms into the uh, into that canister and made the first gator bug the first keto bug and the gator bug you know became we fished it on a chick head with an exposed hook sometimes we would have we would have we'd have weed guards on the on those uh, on those exposed hook chick heads so that it's another element in in the whole realm of, of fishing and the, the the another thing is the french fry which was you know it predates the Cinco too, and it post post dates the the the, the beetle in the beetle spin. But it, we always fish that on the jig head too. The this the uh, the French fry was always used generally on a Carolina rig or a Mojo rig or a, or a split shot rig essentially, and it was big time things like on Table Rock and Bull Shoals. It never was too big up here in Kansas. So when you showed that reaper, um, kind of that eel looking profile and that eel style, that leech kind of style bait, it obviously reminisces of like modern day drop shot baits is what it looks like. It looks like a lot of the stuff that folks are throwing on drop shots now has that. So obviously I know that hasn't been around quite as long. I don't think as, as some of the tactics that we're talking about here, but has that made its way into kind of the, the finesse fishing over your way? Is that a a big part of this puzzle now? We we were actually... I, I don't want to say we're anti drop shotters, you know. Okay. They don't work, I was wondering. They don't, work, <laughs> they don't, yeah, I'm not against them, but they don't work as well, honestly, for our type of. We're shallow water fishermen. You know, I don't believe in fishing deep water. I, I, uh, I can go on a tirade about deep water fishing, how bad it is on fish. You know, really, it causes all kinds of viral trauma effects on them, affects their eyeballs, affects their livers, affects, affects their hearts, affects their brains. So, we have people now in Table Rock Lake catching fish out of 90 feet of water. And I, you know, I'm against it. I think it's, I think it's, it, if you catch them, you can't put them back. And if you, and you take them out and you have to quit fishing, you got your li- limit. So I, I, I'm really against it. And, but I'm an old man, you know, I'm just like, I, I'm not a live scoper. And so, you know, so I, it, it's the whole motif. And I mean, we used to fish deep too. I used to do it and uh, I don't do it anymore. I don't fish. 15 feet is deep for me. And most of the time, even in the middle of the winter, I'm fishing from five to maybe 12 feet of water. So that's, uh, so that's it. All right, we'll get back to our conversation with Ned in just a second, but first, a quick message from Dark Horse Tackle. A different kind of ad today, because Dark Horse Tackle and I have been working on something for the past couple weeks, and we're finally ready to announce it. It's the Tackle Talk Podcast Spring Box. So this isn't a subscription. You don't have to sign up for a full year or anything like that. It's a single box that you can purchase on the Dark Horse Tackle website. So last fall, the boys over at Dark Horse and I kind of worked together, and I handpicked all of the baits that went into the November box. It was a ton of fun. We introduced a lot of people to a lot of baits that are kind of absolute staples of mine. So in the wintertime, it was, you know, blade baits. It was big Joshy swim baits. It was Jigmaster sled heads. For the dabble pack, we put in Ned Rig plastics, um, all of that, and a ton more. So we had a lot of really good feedback after that, a lot of messages. And uh, and you guys ask for more of it, so we're going to deliver it. So available right now for pre-order is the very first Tackle Talk podcast spring box. I worked hand-in-hand hand with Jason and Josh over there to handpick every single bait in this box. The baits themselves, the sizes, the colors, the weights, every little detail because I want it to be what I like to throw in the springtime. So think pre-spawn, think bed fishing, we cover it all. So this box is chock full of springtime staples, and I'm not going to spoil the surprises for you, I'm not going to tell you what's inside, but I can tell you the box is worth it. So go over right now to darkhorsetackle.com, click shop, and select the Tackle Talk Podcast Spring Box. Now a quick note here, the discounts are not going to apply. We 
packed this thing full. The margins are so razor thin. The Tackle Talk 20 will not work for the box. It will work for anything else on the website. You want to do a subscription, you want to do apparel, whatever it may be, Tackle Talk 20 at checkout will save you some money, but not for this box. This box itself is priced kind of at what we had to do to be able to put the box together. So go over to darkhorsetackle.com, click shop, and check out with the Tackle Talk podcast spring box available now for pre-order. Be sure to head over there quick. It's a limited run. I don't know how many we're able to do, but I know there's only a limited number of them. This is the first time we've mentioned on the show, so I don't know how quickly they're going to go. But if you go to darkhorsetackle.com, click shop, Tackle Talk podcast spring box. If you want a box, handpicked by yours truly. All right, let's get back to our conversation with Mr. Ned Cady. So I want to pick your brain specifically on three uh, specific aspects about throwing finesse and specifically Ned Riggs too, but but finesse in general. I want to break this down by rods, line choice, and jig head weight. Those are three things okay. that I'm really curious about your kind of opinion on all of this stuff. I know a little bit from what I've read, but I'd love to hear it from you. First, on the rod side of things. So I actually pulled a quote from from an article because I think it, it perfectly describes me and a lot of the people that are going to be listening to this. So you had wrote after Gary Loomis uh, sold his company Shimano in 1995, the availability of the SJ6400 and the SJ700 rod blanks gradually came to an end, and then it wasn't until like spring of 2021 that Drew Reese began researching the internet in hopes of finding a rod blank that was smaller. But because of the modern day angling, and everybody is so enamored, and then you put in parentheses, for some unlightened and benighted reason with long rods, uh, it was a chore to find a rod less than six foot. So that's me. I I am the unenlightened, <laughs> benighted person who loves <laughs> long rods. And it's and it's weird because Forgive you're me. right. That's the way that the industry is going. Everything's going longer. My two spinning rods that I use 95% of the time are 7.1 and 7.3. And so can and I think a lot of people listening to this are probably in the same boat. Can you at least attempt to probably explain to me and those other folks what it is about those shorter rods? Like I know back in the day there was like the 5.4 Stinger and all of that. Can you kind of explain what makes those rods so special for finesse fishing? Well, first of all, uh, the only the only great advantage of a long rod in my mind is uh, if if you're fishing in extremely clear water and you have to make long casts and you're catching fish on the initial drop, you know, it's it's more difficult to for us to properly. Uh, we have six different retrieves, actually five. When we we have one we call a stroll, which is is part of, and it's. Uh, and it's it's more difficult to use a long rod and 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 control your your retrieve properly, you know. So that's one very 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 important aspect. Is a short rod really does allow you to be more effective in your retrieve, and it's it's a, it's really a joy to fish, you know. I, I'm going to show you this rod. I just that that drew just actually gave me and I, 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 I frugality and simplicity was always been my major thing. I, I, I have an old rod here that I've been, I used for 25 years to drew. This is, this is old. This is a Cardinal four. I bought these reels back in 1970. And this, you can see it doesn't have a bail on it. It's, 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 it's a manual bail. Okay. And this is, this is a, this is a very inexpensive, Shakespeare rod. This one actually is six feet. You know, it's a medium action. I use these rods for, for decades, 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 decades. And in this reel I bought in 1970 for 20 bucks. You know, this was expensive back in 1970, but you know, it's, but I have I have scores of them. Uh, but people have given to me because they said they're they're no good. That but I cut the bail off, so I don't, I don't have to worry about bail springs. But I retired this rod and all my reels on November 4th. 2021 and i changed over drew finally got me into the modern world you know on november 4th and he gave me one of his new rods this rod actually weighs one ounce 1.4 ounces and daniel nussbaum who who gave me this reel it's a it's it's a it's a daiwa basista and it's a very expensive reel you know and uh, so and it's spooled with four pound test uh, fire line. And I've been throwing this thing. I don't know you can't see it probably, can you? Yeah, I can actually read a little bit. Does it say it's 610? This says it's 610, but it's not. 
We okay, I was about to ask if it was if it was shrunk down a little bit. It, yeah, because we can't buy them. If we can't buy a five four, we have to we have to cut them down. But Drew sent his old Shema, his old his his old uh, Gary Loomis set Loomis's rods down five four to guys down a mud hole, and they 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 actually rep found in their blanks rods that would would equal the old. SJ six forty and SJ seven hundred, and this this is a, this is an SJ six forty ride right here, and uh, it it's incredible. And, I, and it, it, these new reels, these new Daiwa reels with with four pound test line. I mean, I I can cast ninety feet with just a flip like that. honestly I, I can, and I've I've don't thrown. I'm I'm fishing a. This is a sixteenth ounce mushroom head jig. With a, uh, it's a Z-Man. This is a Z, the Z-Man Hog Z on it. That's, uh, it's, yeah, this kind of the replica of the puddle jumper, essentially in a lot of ways. And it's just, uh, it's simple and it's lovely and it's just fun. And I, you know, I, my my back in the old days, sensitivity. When I, I do some, I do some uh, some uh, field testing for some people occasionally, and. They're always asking about this, uh, but about uh, especially when dealing with different lines. But you know, on my old rods, I really couldn't feel anything. Sensitivity was nothing. I, I I call Midwest finesse fishing no feel fishing. If you feel what your bait's doing, you're doing something wrong. But now these rods are so sensitive in this line, I can actually feel when I'm hitting coontail or hitting sago pond weed. I think I'm not sure of yet because I have only fished this thing for about. The month of November and December, I think I can tell the difference between different bedroom and and our different between bushy pond weed, sago pond weed, curly leaf pond weed, and, and coontail. I think I can tell the difference. I'm not sure I will be able to tell by yeah by next July. I should be able to know, but I you know you just I'm just learning a lot, and I it seems like most of the time I can't feel a strike, you know, and anything, but I'm I can kind of. It, I can kind of feel a, a strike more on this on these rods, this rod and reel system than I did ever before. And, you know, most of the time you see your line pop, or you just it's just it's kind of an intuition. I, you, mainly, I fish by you into intuition, and uh, so it's it's it, it's really these rods have changed my changed my life. And, and Drew Drew used to make make rods. For for the Stinger rods and for for Ray Fink, he worked there as a college student back in the 1960s, and so it's really uh, and he's a retired old guy now too. He's in his 70s, so but he he made these rods up for me, and Daniel Nussum uh, gave me the reel. So he tried to, they got me out of the out of the 1970s into in, in the 21st century. You mentioned one thing on that setup that to me, and I think a lot of people that are listening is, is going to blow their mind a little bit. I think I heard you right, right? You're throwing four pound test on that setup. Yeah, I am now. Yeah. That's the first time ever. Yes. And it's work. I, I was doubtful, but I haven't even, I've only changed my leader knot uh, three times since November 4th. And I, I, I should have counted how many bass we've got, but uh, several hundred several hundred bass you know in in that in that time period and i haven't i i actually broke off uh uh two jig two jigs i got caught up in in, in a hedge in a hedge tree that's uh, a pile and i but that's the only time i've broken up you know i don't i don't really break off a lot of stuff i don't get hung up a lot you know and then that's uh with the 16th ounce jigs and stuff so you said you have a leader knot there so are you running four pound braid to uh like a floral leader of some sort I got a floral leader, yeah. Floral. Okay. I'm using. I'm using. I'm using. This is six pound test fluorocarbon on this thing. Okay, because I think that's gonna shock a lot of people too. Around here, again, modern anglers have this notion where everything has to be bigger, everything has to be heavier, everything has to be you know longer. We we just keep going to that extreme, and it's really cool to hear you know because you're setting the hook on fish, you're not breaking fish off, you're you're doing perfectly fine with four pound test, and I think that might be. Part of my issue too, when I go to these longer rods, I'm going to these longer rods because I'm throwing, you know, ten pound braid to a a ten pound leader, or sometimes depending if there's you know toothy stuff around, a twelve pound leader or something. So I think if I would back that down a little bit, then I could get down to this, you know, lighter, shorter rod and still make the same cast that I want to because 
the style that we fish around here, uh, like I said, it's, it's a lot of river fishing or a lot of creek fishing. So what we are, I'm looking for casting distance is what I'm looking for like 90% of the time because you're on one side of the river, it's too deep to cross. The Of course, the juiciest eddy is always on the other side. It can't ever be on your side. So, yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, you know, you're trying to make these bomb casts with everything. But, you know, it's interesting to hear that you're you're able to back it down that much to a, a four pound you know, braid to a floor leader and doing just fine with it. So I think that'll give a lot of people listening this confidence. Like you don't have to beef that up so much. No, you don't. And actually the first time I used these rods was, was with, with, with uh, Drew. Uh, that was, was back in July. And I got a 10 pound drum on it, you know, but they're not great fighters, but they're, they're, you know, 10 pound, we actually weighed 11 pounds and we weighed it and, and, and it, uh, worked worked very very well and it uh and i've got you know, between a four and five I, I don't ever weigh my fish you know but four pound five pounds somewhere between four five pound bass with it and uh, patty's got one four or four and a half four five pound bass with it too so and that's uh and it, it it's it's great we never yeah if you ever notice if you watch if you watch major league fishing you know, all these guys are using long rods and when they're when they're landing the fish, they get they have their have their hand almost up 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 to the f- first guide, you know, and so it's I, I've never been able to understand it. How far do you cast? So what, what's what's your long cast on those rivers? Without measuring it, I'm not real sure. I, I would say probably a little over 100 feet. Probably is so like from home plate to second base, 120 feet. Probably around that, maybe 10 more feet sometimes. So say 130 feet. Yeah. But again, sometimes that's with like a three eighths ounce, you know, lure of some sort, right? It's not always the finesse lures that I can get to go that far. Yeah, I, I, I you know, I, I can cast 120 feet, you know, from home plate to second base um, with, with a with a one sixteenth ounce or one thirty second ounce. 16, but I'm using a, I'm using what a, a finesse TRD, which is a heavier bait than. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not. I don't think I can cast this hog Z that far, or a, or a finesse shad Z. So the the jig heads themselves is the next question I wanted to ask, because yep. I think there's a lot of uh, choices out there. There's a lot of difference of opinion on all this kind of stuff. But, you know, uh, most people know, obviously, when you think of a, a Ned rig, we'll go with that, right? You're thinking of a mushroom head style, you know, jig head with some sort of small plastic on it. Again, today they're getting more creative than ever. You have everything from, you know, the TRDs and kind of your small, you know, worm like you have your your hogs, you have your. Um, you know, everything, creature baits, everything is being shrunk down to be put on a mushroom style head. Um, but I think there's a couple th- ways that this is going that we're straying a little bit from what probably the initial design of a Ned rig was first is heavy weights. I see, I fit, like I said, I fish a lot of rivers. I fish with a lot of people on the river. I mean, it's not uncommon for me to see one tenth for me to see three sixteenths, even a quarter ounce sometimes of people mm-hmm. throwing, you know, these, these heavier jig heads with a small plastic on it and, you know, calling it a Ned rig and, and that's what it is. But I have to imagine those heavier weights have some consequences to them. You're not getting the motion because it sounds like what you're doing a lot of times with these light weights is you're getting hit on the fall or you said there's like, you know, six different retrieves that we'll get to in a little bit too. But I'm assuming a lot of your fish are coming a little bit suspended and are not completely on the bottom, just dredging that, that jig head down there. Like a lot of people I think tend to, because nowadays anglers want to feel everything. I, I think we talked about this in an email too. I, we want to feel the bottom. We want to feel our lure. We want to feel, you know, the cover it's going over. That's, that's what gives us solace and gives us feeling of control is to be able to feel something. But it sounds like you're catching a lot of those fish or, or targeting a lot of those fish somewhat suspended. Is that true? Uh, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, that would be true. I, I think, uh, I think, but most of our fish were catching with the, with a retrieve we call swim, glide, and shake, and that that retrieve is done so that the uh, the the bait that the uh, the rig is coming from six to twelve, maybe a little bit, maybe two feet above the bottom, and we're just allowing this bait to swim. And then stop and as we could call a glide. And before we start re- 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 reeling the reel handle again, we shake, shake, shake. And that's and that and that if these fish are, are above the bottom, they could be. We catch them above the bottom, you know. So, uh, and we're fishing, we're fishing shallow water, you know, from one to uh, twelve feet. So it, these, it, I don't know. I actually do not know where these fish are. I don't have a live scope to tell you. It's it really so, but I just know you. 
I, I, we do catch them on the bottom by a couple of our retrieves, which by three of our different retrieves too, you know, so we catch them a variety of ways, but we catch them with light, with light, light baits. As Gato Hidden once told these, these guys out in California, he says, everybody tries to fish too heavy of a jig you know, or too heavy a weight, you know, and lighter weights just, just make those baits work better for me to catch fish, you know? And so that's, and he was fishing heavier baits and, or jigs than I'm fishing now. I've, I found that, you know, in our water, I fish, I'm fishing more aquatic vegetation than he did because the Lake of the Ozarks didn't have aquatic vegetation only for three years of our life. Did it have Eurasian milfoil and then it, and they, they killed it, but it's, uh, and it's, but it's, it's really important to have a light, light jig in my mind. I mean, but guys like Drew Reese, he fishes a heavier jig than I do. And he's, he's probably the best finesse fisherman I know, you know, essentially. And he, he fishes three months a year up and up in the Lake of the Woods. And, and, and uh, so he's, he's, he's really got this down. And so the thing I love about fishing, obviously, I'm, I'm a nerd for it, is that you can have 10 of the best anglers in the world and you can give them a rig and they're all going to fish it different ways with different weights. Different and, way. Yep. And, it, and it's going to be Definitely. great, which is the the absolute funnest part of our sport is experimenting yes. with it and to each their own. Right. And it's like a quarterback, you know, all quarterbacks have different different motifs when they're playing football and it's hard to replicate anybody, you know, so. Yeah, so it's just it's just just the way fishing is too, you know. And I I tried to replicate Guido Hidden for many decades, and I gave up, you know, because I <laughs> couldn't see as well as he could. You know, Guido would never want to put his trolling motor down in the water when he was going down a shoreline. He would let the wind blow it down a lot of times because he didn't, his his motif in life was to make the quietest bass boat in the history of the world, and that's what he what he wanted to do, you know. And so, and uh, I'm too I'm too noisy actually for. And I, my eyesight wasn't as good, but he could see, he could see great things. So I, I tried to emulate him, but I gave up. And all I do is just fish like an old codger now, geriatrically. Well, speaking. the only thing I'll say on that too is there's probably, like you said, there's not a right or wrong way to do this. But if you're going to throw a heavier head, if you're going to throw a, you know, a three sixteenths or a quarter ounce, we'll get to it in a little bit because I'm sure you're probably going to tell us when we get into these retrieves. But I would assume there's a couple of these retrieves, if there's six of them, that you just can't do as well with a heavier jig head than you can with a lighter jig head. Just like the one you talked about, the, you know, swim and shake and everything. That's probably going to be tougher to do with, you know, a quarter ounce jig head than it's going to be with a, you know, with a one sixteenth or a one thirty second. Yeah. yeah. Have, did, have you ever read our Travis Myers? He lives in Powell, uh, West Virginia. He, 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 uh, he, uh, he used to contribute to lots of logs. We used to have a thing called Midwest Finesse on a monthly guides. Uh, look, look them up in, uh, he hasn't re- contributed much anything in the last oh year or two, but he fishes. He fishes uh, Midwest finesse with, uh, you know, he, he's using he's using Gary Loomis's uh, trout rods. Essentially, they're longer than six six. They're about the, uh, but he's using light line and stuff like that, and using sixteenth ounce uh, uh, jig heads. And maybe even one thirty seconds. I can't quite remember now. But his name is Travis Myers, and he he lives he lives in in, in northeastern West Virginia. Fishes rivers. That's all he fishes is rivers. Yeah. The other thing which you hinted at earlier, which I thought was really interesting, and I think what you said about the Texas rig is probably going to preface this conversation pretty well. But the other phenomenon that you're seeing with with Ned rigs is weedless Ned rigs. You're mm-hmm. seeing this move toward a more kind of uh, mushroom style head that's molded onto an EWG hook and, right. and you're seeing that gain popularity, which right or wrong, right? It's the same thing as basically a Texas rig with with the weight pegged is, is sure. essentially yeah. what it becomes. But do you think it's odd that folks are equating that with a Ned rig when it's just so different from, I mean, you can't fish that the way that you're probably going to tell us the five or six different ways that you're going to fish a Ned rig, right? It's, yeah, a, it's almost never, a totally never, different rig. Yeah, I've, I've never, I never used them, so I really can't tell you how, how you can fish them. But uh, yeah, it, it just just goes against my 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 grain of thought, the way I think about fishing. So I just uh, I've seen them, and, and I and I have a couple of people have sent them to me to to look at, and and I just have not have just not have used them. I just don't find any need to use them in in the waterways that I fish. So I, but it's. People, you know, I learned also from Gato Hibben too is fish 
nothing looking banks. He used to call them. these are nothing looking banks, you know, and they're and you know, I don't if there's a, a series of standing timber brush piles and stuff. I, I just let you put, let the par fishermen fish that stuff. I go f- fish stuff that they don't fish. I'm I'm kind of exaggerating a little bit because I fish around brush piles too and so in in docks and things like that. But I but I know how to do that without getting hung up, you know. So and I won't get hung up. Sure, everybody's going to get hung up, but I, I can fish it. I can I can fish one of these uh, mushroom head jigs for actually a month without losing it, you know. And uh, that's just a. Uh, and I and my hooks are dull as dull can be. It would drive it would drive breweries crazy. My hooks my hooks get so dull. But that's just you know just the way I am. I'm just a, I'm a tight wad frugal freak in a way, you know. So that's uh, you know I just I don't want to lose those gu- those mushroom head jigs because I love them, you know. So let's talk about that because I I know I mentioned before we uh, set up this conversation that that was one of the things that I have trouble with a lot of times is I do snag a lot of if I'm if I'm going with an exposed hook I think self diagnosis wise there's probably two reasons for it one of which is weight of the jig head right I think if I would back down my weight of my jig head I probably don't run into a lot of these issues but we do fish a lot of fast moving rivers with chunk rock which I think yeah. is where where this type of this small of a rig gets gets in some trouble because if you get you know if you're in a, a, a current seam and you get swept in a you know in a hole this big in between chunk rock you can snap that thing all you want and unless you're able to get on the other side of it you're not really yeah. able to get it back so I think that's probably mostly my issue but I know you said and it still blows my mind the the so small amount of times that you're getting snagged or hung up is it is it because so many of your retrieves or a lot of them are fished above the bottom to a little bit of an extent? Because I think a lot of people have this this mindset where with a Ned rig, they drop it down to the bottom, hits the bottom, they feel the bottom, they hop it. And they just hop it on the bottom. And that's all they do with it. Or they give it, you know, little drags where it seems like you have a lot more nuance to it. And a lot of your stuff is happening, you know, even if it is six inches to a foot above the water. I think that probably helps with snags. Am I Am I off on that? No, I think you're right. And I, I would say, you know, throughout throughout a, a calendar year, I would say 60%, maybe 65%, I'm not really sure on this, would be the swim the swim glide and shake retrieve. And the other time I, I would going to be, I'm going to be dragging and shaking or dragging and dead sticking or, or hop, what we call hop and drop type 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 thing you know and so those those three are on the bottom drag and shake drag drag and dead stick and and hop and hop and drop and uh so but i say 65 percent of the time i am and if we do a swimming we do a straight swim too uh, what we charlie brewer you remember charlie brewer from from brew charlie had to do nothing retrieve you know and he would just he would just let it swim he called polishing the rocks he would just let it kind of glide over the rocks he would call it polishing the rocks, but he would never shake it. We 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 do we do quite a bit of shaking when we swim it too. We just straight swim, but other times we'll do nothing. But it's I think it's uh, you know sixty five percent of the time we're not, we are not touching the bottom. If we're touching the bottom, I I fished Gato Hibben hooked me up with a guy named Shin Fukai. Shin is a is a Japanese uh, angler and Shin. Uh, was down, I was April 1st, 2006. I did a story on him for in Fisherman down at Beaver Lake. He won the uh, Beaver Lake uh, FLW tournament down there. And he was fishing a, uh, a Gary Yamamoto uh, sh- uh, shad shape worm. Okay. And this is the first time I ever seen it. It was only available at that time in Japan. It wasn't available anyplace else. And he was fishing it. He was fishing it on. Yeah. We didn't know what size to. We couldn't translate what the what the weight what was was from Japanese into English, you know. But it was bigger than a one sixteenth, you know. It, I don't know what it wasn't quite a three thirty second, but somewhere in there. But he would uh, he would say, if I if I touch bottom, I do wrong. If I touch bottom, I do wrong. And he was swimming this thing. He was telling me about you know foot two feet above the above the rocks and he was throwing it around all kinds of standing timber and everything you know and uh, i don't know if he ever got i don't can't recall you got i fished with i didn't fish i watched him fish for eight hours and i don't think he got hung up once and he ended up winning the two hundred thousand dollars down there on that tournament you know and it was just fishing this uh, fishing fishing that bait and 
you know, after I got back, I was, I was, uh, I was, I was been enamored with at that time. I started getting enamored just right after that with Elastec Bates, you know, and so, and Z-Man was making all this stuff for striking and, and they're making some stuff for themselves at the beginning. So I told them, I just wrote them a letter. I said, can you guys make a sad shape for them? And they, they, they didn't know who I was, you know, they thought I was some nut. <laughs> Probably I don't know what it was, you know. They so they, they they you know they didn't really pay attention. But eventually I, I bugged them quite a bit, and they finally said they had a, they had a bait made that they they were in the Aust, Aust, in Australia market too, for saltwater, and they had the finesse shad Z. So they weren't selling it in in the United States, but eventually they started after we bugged them enough, they uh, started selling the shad, sh- and that that in the the zinker Z. For about five years, were what our essence of the what so-called Ned rig was, you know, back back and then, and from 2007 uh, to 2010, 2011, you know, I don't know, I can't. Sometime about 2010, they came out with the they introduced the shad shape worm, and they said the finesse shad Z. So you, I think we we might have over this whole you know uh, hour or so so far have hit most of the retrieves but if i remember right i wrote some of them down as you were saying them too yeah. so swim glide and shake it sounds like 60 to 65 percent of the time is what you're throwing but the other ones i heard you mention dragging and shake dragging and dead stick hop and drop and then straight swim are those straight your, swim so well, you said well, i think you said there were six maybe six right? that that's that's five okay and then the guy in the back of the boat he gets the stroll and he can he can employ all those other those five five uh, motifs or trees while we're while we're strolling he just he just casting the boat casting the bait behind the boat at kind of 45 degree angle okay and that and that bait is just going to go end up behind the boat and he's just going to be either doing a drag and shake or a drag and dead stick he could dead stick it by opening his bail up or taking his rod back you know uh, uh, let his lay stay there just for you know two seconds three seconds whatever or he can do a uh, hop, hop and drop, or hop and bounce, whatever how you ever want to call it. And he'd do the swim, glide, and shake, and just do the straight swim too. You know, he may have to reel a little bit in straight swim. Actually, Rick Clun told me a story <clears throat> years ago. I was kind of doing a story on on him, and he said because uh, I was I was fishing like this this stuff, crazy stuff, which you know Rick would never. Rick actually did fish a. A shaky head uh, worm back in 2006 for a while in the spinning tackle, but he hardly probably. Uh, I saw him at a Kansas City boat show one time. He, he was doing a seminar and I was doing one, and I had three spinning rods. He said, That's more spinning rods I ever owned in my life. He told <laughs> I, he He's a heavy joking. tackle I, guy I, for I sure. Know, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. But uh, but he told me he was he, uh, he was uh, fishing uh, his partner in one tournament. I think he was down oh, someplace in Georgia, and he, Rick was, was working, working a uh, Rip rap bank, maybe like the dam or some rip rap on a uh, causeway, and he was parallel in it, fishing with probably a rattle trap type, you know, a, a swim bait of some sort. And the Japanese guy on the back of the boat was uh, was strolling behind the boat. You know, strolling was you can't troll in VA that's that's tournaments, but so he had to be moving it. But he was kind of strolling, which, which was you know so much strolling, and he was catching bass right behind the boat. And Rick was kind of amazed by that whole thing. So. And I was, and and just, uh, I just I was telling Shin Fukai about that. He said, "Yeah, that's we we stroll all the time in Japan." He says, "You know, so it's a, and that's just what just part of part of the whole motif that uh, and strolling is really a good thing for the guy in the back of the boat. And every once in a while, you know, we all have to do it. When it's the guy in the back of the boat, and only he's the only guy catching it, the guy in the front of the boat is going to stroll because you know, casting behind the boat a different angle. Most most fishermen want to cast." In a forty-five degree, or in front of the boat, and it's just a different angle. These the fish never, very seldom see. So when you're casting behind the boat and working that way, it's funny that you mentioned Rick. So uh, we actually had Rick Clon on last week. Uh, oh, did you? And and yeah. he was talking. And it's funny because it's this is again what I love about fishing is the just different strokes for different folks kind of things where you're you were joking about him not having a lot of spinning rods he told us last week that he's throwing a small like the small size rico popper on a seven foot heavy 
casting rod, which to me, again, blows my mind because I throw it on spinning tackle and, and small spinning tackle, and it just shows how how just different and polar opposite some folks can be. And sure. so, you know, last week we're talking about throwing a small popper on seven foot heavy rods, and this week it's it's five four four pound <laughs> line and right. <laughs> and yeah. well, one thirty second jig. One hundred eighty degrees different about everything and fishing. I think you know. So. And that's what that's what we love about it, right? That's what keeps yeah. us coming back is that it's it's such a fun puzzle to try and put together, and it's a puzzle with no no um objectively right answers a lot of times sure, a lot of right, this is definitely. subjective which is yeah. fun well i appreciate it thank you so much i i mean this when i say that this was an absolute treat it is an honor to get to talk to someone that has the knowledge the history the you know just kind of the the overall kind of record keeping i guess of a lot of this type of fishing um that's been so important to me obviously growing up in central ohio and being a midwest you know fisherman my whole life finesse obviously made its way into my life fairly early and still a huge part of it. I know everybody listening is going to get a huge kick out of this. Um, before we let you go, I know obviously you you have kind of uh, taken a step back from a lot of the writing and the, and the public stuff, but is there anywhere, if anybody's listening to this, that they want to keep up with what you're doing that they can kind of follow uh, what you're up to? Sure. That, we do a we thing called the Finesse News, News Network, and they can just, they can just uh, get a hold of me just by... N K E H D E at gmail.com. And I'll put them on the finesse news network and they can, they can be able to get our logs. We'll get, we get logs from people from Tennessee and in Texas and stuff like that. And we, we publish them every day. We haven't published one, only three this month because uh, everybody's been mother nature has just put the, you know, he's really been walloped us, you know, lately. Bow man winter. You know, we, we didn't have any bad weather at all in December, and it was almost like May we were fishing in, in December. Now it's uh, we're iced up. So it's uh, they can get a hold of me. And they can also, uh, Z Man Fishing Products is, is publishing our monthly uh, monthly uh, logs, and they, they can get those. Just go to Z Man's uh, website. And it's I either I think it's their products. Z goes to the Z Man fishing product fishing products. Just could just and then maybe look up Ned Rake on it. And if that they can't find it, just email me and I'll give him the link too. Because I don't exactly know, but Z Man does it every month. And now I used to do it within Fisherman, but I kind of retired for it. And, I, and then Z Man wanted to do it, so we just get, and that you know I I don't work for Z Man. I don't get. I don't get paid anything. I, I, I'm a, I'm was an outdoor writer, so I don't ever want to get paid for any of these baits that people are making or using my name for it because it would be, you know, be obscene to do that because I want to, I try to cover everybody's baits essentially, but I do. I'm a, I'm, I love Z-Man baits because I use them all the time because they don't wear out. It's part of my frugality mentality, you know? And so, I mean, we've had, we've caught 235 fish on one Z-Man worm, you know? And so it's, uh, it's, uh, I, I, that's what I love about it. Then the older they get, some of them, the older they get, sometimes the better they are, you know, too. It's really kind of a, a marvelous. The first time we used a, a last tag bait was October 10th, October 12th, 2006. A friend of mine, Dick Bessie, he's, he's dead now, but we were down at a, at a 550 acre uh, city reservoir. And uh, we fished four hours. We had 109 largemouth bass, two wiper, and one walleye in four hours. And they were caught on the two and a half inch. They were the zero, the striking, striking zero, which is a last act bait that Z Man makes. And we had, and we used that same bait for another whole month. And it was, we had, had we had 109 largemouth bass on that thing. And I don't know how many we caught afterwards, but it was, we was it was we were amazed because we were so used to using Cinco's and and Yum Dingers, and we'd go through a package of them or a day or no more, you know. So we had the same one. You can buy a, a guy can buy a package of uh, Z Man Zinkers, and you can you can you can you can go two months, three months on a package there now. So and they better they get better. So. Well, Andrew, thank you very much. It's been a joy working with you. And uh, we'll get you some geriatric fishing, maybe. I probably won't be around to see you geriatrically, but it'll be good. So thank you very much. 
All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is our conversation with the one and only Ned Katie. I can't thank Ned enough for taking the time to talk with me. An absolute joy to talk with. He is a wealth of knowledge for Midwest finesse fishing, for finesse fishing in general, for honestly fishing in general. He's a true kind of historian, a true record keeper, um, somebody that we really need to kind of preserve the history of certain techniques that we now use so often and we take for granted where they came from or who they came from or who kind of pioneered this. Ned is a core cornerstone for being able to keep track of that information and to continue to keep it going for generations. So yes, when people think Ned Katie, they think the Ned Rig, but now hopefully after this episode, you think a lot more about Ned and kind of what he does for the fishing industry, what he does for history, and what he means, especially to us here in the Midwest. All right. Thank you guys so much for listening. I appreciate you guys a ton. Please feel free to subscribe, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeart, wherever you listen to podcasts. Leave us a review on Apple. That helps a ton. And we will see you right back here next Tuesday for another brand new episode of Tackle Talk. Thank you for listening to the Tackle Talk Podcast. Tackle Talk is produced by Andrew Hayes. Copyright 2021. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. 